Welcome to the Anatomy and Physiology series on the skeletal system. This first video will focus on the bones of the skull. Looking at the skull, the first thing we'll look at are all of the big flat bones that make up the major portion of the skull, the cranium. In the front here, we see this big bone in purple called the frontal bone. Right behind the frontal bone, we have the two parietal bones. And in the very back, we have the occipital bone. Occipital bone, parietal bones, frontal bone. Looking at the side of the skull, we have the temporal bone, right where your temple is on the side of your head. And right in front of the temporal bone, we see this little portion of the sphenoid bone. And the sphenoid bone is actually one single butterfly-shaped bone that continues all the way across behind the eyes and over to this side of the skull. So frontal bone, parietal bone, temporal bone, sphenoid bone, and in the back, occipital bone. Looking at the front of the skull, we can see many facial bones. These bones that protrude on either side are the zygomatic bones, which give you your cheekbones. Right here at the bridge of the nose, we have the nasal bone. Looking at the upper and lower jaw, we have the maxilla on the top and the mandible on the bottom. Inside the nasal cavity here, we have this small thin bone called the vomer. And extending up from the vomer, we actually have a plate of cartilage called the nasal septum that divides the nasal cavity into left and right portions. So that mandible, maxilla, vomer, and nasal bone. Looking inside the orbit or eye socket, we see that we have a few other bones in here. We said that we have the sphenoid bone back here, this green portion. Coming up this way, this yellow bone is showing us the ethmoid. There's an ethmoid here, and then you can see the ethmoid over on this side. Right in front of the ethmoid, this little tiny pink sliver is showing you a small bone called the lacrimal bone. The lacrimal bone. And that's right where the lacrimal apparatus is, which is involved in draining the tears from your eyes. So from there, we'll start to look at the way that the bones come together when the skull is forming. When an infant is born, the skull bones aren't fused together like this. They're actually separate with little bands of cartilage in between them. The reason for that is that the, the infant can make its way through the birth canal and its head can kind of form and mold and squeeze to fit through that birth canal which is why often babies are born with kind of odd-shaped heads or cone heads. As the infant grows through that first year of life, the bones then fuse together. And at the areas where the bones fused together, we have this joint called a suture. We have four different sutures that you guys are expected to know. In the front here is the coronal suture the coronal suture, right between the frontal bone and the parietal bones. Going back, right here, in between the two parietal bones, we have the sagittal suture. Sagittal. Just like the sagittal plane divides the body into left and right portions, the sagittal suture divides the head into left and right portions. Looking at the back of the skull, we have the landoid suture going right over the occipital bone here, the lambdoid suture. And then finally, looking at the side of the head here, around the temporal bone, we have the squamous suture. Squamous, named squamous because this part of the skull is flat, and squamous means flat, just like a squamous cell is a thin, flat cell. Okay, so the squamous suture, the lambdoid suture, the sagittal suture, and finally, the coronal suture. Now we'll take a second and look at the skull in more detail. When we look at the skull, we see that there's lots of different holes in it, tiny little holes that we call foramen. 
The reason for this is that if you think about inside the skull, we have our brain. And our brain has to connect to all of the different parts of our body via nerves. So we'll have nerves that travel from the brain out through these little holes to get to the eye. Or we'll have nerves that travel out to get to our mouth or our tongue. The spinal cord has to leave the brain to get down to the lower parts of our body. So we have to have areas or holes or canals in the skull for these things to be able to leave this, this hard, dense cavity. So looking at the different holes here, we see right above the orbit or eye socket, <clears throat> excuse me, we have the supraorbital foramen. And foramen just means hole. Supra meaning above, orbital, above the orbit hole. Supra orbital foramen. If you look right below the orbit on either side, we also have an infraorbital foramen. Infraorbital foramen, below the orbit. Finally, looking down here on either side of the chin, we have a mental foramen. And remember that mental is the anatomical term for chin. So this is the mental foramen on this side, the mental foramen. Also, looking at the front of the skull, we see each of these little bulges here where there's actually a little indentation or a hole for the tooth to be inserted. Each one of these, what we call tooth sockets, is actually called a dental alveolus. Okay, so this is a dental alveolus. This is a dental alveolus. Up on the top jaw or the maxilla, this is a dental alveolus. This is a dental alveolus. Okay? As a whole, or for plural, we call them dental alveoli. Also, looking inside the nasal cavity here, we see that on either lateral wall or side wall of the nasal cavity, we have these little projections that stick out. And these are little areas of the bone that literally curl in. The reason that we have these is so that when we breathe air in through the nasal cavity, we can create turbulence in that air. The air gets swished and bounced around these curls. Okay, that turbulence allows us to help filter dust particles out of the air and bounce those particles around so that they get stuck in the mucus in the nasal cavity. When we name these bony shelves or bony protrusions, we name them after the conch shell because the curling of that bone looks just like the curling in a conch shell. So on either side, the bottom of these little shelves is the inferior nasal concha, or conche, either one's fine. And then the next one up that we see here in yellow on either side is the middle nasal concha. There's actually a superior one up even higher, but we don't see it on this model. Going to the side of the skull, we have a few more details that we need to know. One, this big prominent hole that you see here in part of the temporal bone is the external acoustic meatus. And this is actually the hole that leads into your ear, okay? into your inner ear where your eardrum is. External because it's the external portion of this hole or canal. Acoustic, because this is where sound comes in. And meatus, because this is a large channel. Going straight down from this external acoustic meatus, we have these two prominent processes that stick off of the temporal bone. This large one in the back is the mastoid process. This small pointy one is the styloid process. I remember that mastoid, like a mastiff, is a huge dog, right? And this is a huge process. This styloid is very pointy, just like a stylus is a very pointy little projection that you use to poke on your bone. So the mastoid process and the styloid process, and this hole is the external acoustic meatus. As we go down from this area, we see that the mandible, or the lower jaw, has these two major processes that stick off the top of it. The condylar process and the coronoid process. So the coronoid process is this smaller pointy process in front. 
The condylar process is this larger, rounded process that actually meets up with the temporal bone. Okay? It meets up and articulates with the temporal bone so that we can open and close our mouth. Okay? So the condylar process and the coronoid process. You can remember that the coronoid process is the one in front because it's directly underneath the coronal suture. Okay, remember this is the coronal suture. If you go straight down, you find the coronoid process. We also have two processes right here as part of the temporal bone and the zygomatic bone. We see that the temporal bone has this arm that reaches up towards the zygomatic bone, and the zygomatic bone has this little arm that reaches back towards the temporal bone. These processes are named for the bone that they're going to meet. Okay, so this here is the temporal bone, but this process right here is called the zygomatic process because it's trying to meet the zygomatic bone. Okay? So likewise, this blue bone is a zygomatic bone, but this process right here is the temporal process because it's reaching out to meet the temporal bone. From here, what we'll do is we'll actually take this jaw off. Or not, we'll just move it. And we'll look at the base of the skull. There's a few more structures that we need to look at at the base of the skull. Starting here, if we look at what would be the roof of the mouth, we see that this front yellow part is still part of the maxilla, or upper jaw. But going back, or posterior to this maxilla, this pink area here is showing us the palatine bone. Palatine, just like we call this our hard palate. Okay, so this is the palatine bone. If we extend back here to the base of the skull, we see this very large hole here. This very big hole at the base of the skull is the foramen magnum. Foramen as in hole, magnum because it's big, it's very large. And this is where the spinal cord will leave um, the brain stem. Looking on these outer edges, the anterior lateral edges of the foramen magnum, we have these two protrusions here. And these are called the occipital condyles. Occipital because if you notice, they're part of the occipital bone, okay? These two occipital condyles. And these protrusions are important because they articulate with the top vertebrae. Okay, the very first vertebrae that we have called the atlas okay, will articulate with these occipital condyles when we shake our head, yes, Going straight out from these occipital condyles, we have these rather good sized holes right here and right here where the jugular vein passes. These are called the jugular foramen. Straight up and out from the jugular foramen, we have the carotid canal where the carotid artery passes through. Finally, the last little area that we have here is the part of the temporal bone where the mandible or lower jaw articulates. We call these little grooves here the mandibular fossa. The mandibular fossa. And I'll show you how that bottom jaw articulates. Remember, we have the, the condylar process that reaches up into the mandibular fossa and articulates as we open and close our mouth. The last view that we'll look at with this skull 
actually looking inside the skull. So we're taking the top of the skull off and looking inside it. And this is actually where the base of the brain will be sitting. We've got three major areas to look at here. One is the crista galley. Okay, the crista galley is this yellow bulge we see right here, just the part of the yellow that's sticking up. Okay, the crista galley is important because this is where the meninges will connect. Okay, the meninges are the membranes, um, the connective tissue membranes that line our brain. Okay, you've heard of meningitis which is an infection that causes an inflammation in these meninges that puts pressure on the brain. Okay, those meninges are actually anchored to the skull right here at the crista galley. On either side of that, we have these plates called the cribriform plates. Okay, and those will actually extend down to form the roof of the nasal cavity. Okay, you can kind of see this yellow right here at the roof of the nasal cavity. Okay, that's the cribriform plate extending down. The last thing that we'll look at here inside the skull is the cella tersica. Okay, and the cella tersica is this little saddle like seat right here where the pituitary gland sits. The pituitary gland, as you guys will see next semester, is an important endocrine gland that hangs down from the base of the skull. So it's hanging, or from the base of the brain. It hangs down from the base of the brain, and it's a really tiny little structure, so it needs some support. And it sits right here in this little seat, okay, the cella tersica. You can also see the foramen magnum here, okay, the large hole at the base of the skull. And we can also see the, um, the jugular foramen and where the carotid canal comes, but I'm going to ask you those from this view that I just showed you, okay? Thank you for watching, guys. I'll post another video next about the rest of the axial skeleton.